Chapter One of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter One Introductory. These pages record some of the adventures of the first South Carolina volunteers, the first slave regiment mustered into the service of the United States during the Civil War. It was, indeed, the first colored regiment of any kind so mustered, except a portion of the troops raised by Major General Butler at New Orleans. These scarcely belong to the same class, however, being recruited from the free colored population of that city, a comparatively self-reliant and educated race. The darkest of them, said General Butler, were about the complexion of the late Mr. Webster. The first South Carolina, on the other hand, contained scarcely a free man, had not one mulatto in ten, and a far smaller proportion who could read or write when enlisted. The only contemporary regiment of a similar character was the first Kansas Colored, which began recruiting a little earlier, though it was not mustered in the usual basis of a military seniority till later. See the appendix. These were the only colored regiments recruited during the year 1862. The second South Carolina and the 54th Massachusetts followed early in 1863. This is the way in which I came to the command of this regiment. One day in November 1862, I was sitting at dinner with my lieutenants, John Goodall and Luther Bigelow, in the barracks of the 51st Massachusetts, Colonel Sprague, when the following letter was put into my hands. Beaufort, S.C., November 5, 1862. My dear sir, I am organizing the 1st Regiment of South Carolina Volunteers, with every prospect of success. Your name has been spoken of in connection with the command of this regiment by some friends in whose judgment I have confidence. I take great pleasure in offering you the position of colonel in it, and hope that you may be induced to accept. I shall not fill the place until I hear from you, or sufficient time shall have passed for me to receive your reply. Should you accept, I enclose a pass for Port Royal, of which I trust you will feel disposed to avail yourself at once. I am with sincere regard, yours truly, R. Saxton, Brigadier General, Military Government. Had an invitation reached me to take command of a regiment of Kalmuck Tartars, it could hardly have been more unexpected. I had always looked for the arming of the blacks, and had always felt a wish to be associated with them, had read the scanty accounts of General Hunter's abortive regiment, and had heard rumors of General Saxton's renewed efforts. But the prevalent tone of public sentiment was still opposed to any such attempts. The government kept very shy of the experiment, and it did not seem possible that the time had come when it could be fairly tried. For myself, I was at the head of a fine company of my own raising, and in a regiment to which I was already much attached. It did not seem desirable to exchange a certainty for an uncertainty, for who knew but General Saxton might yet be thwarted in these efforts by the pro-slavery influence that had still so much weight at headquarters. It would be intolerable to go out to South Carolina and find myself, after all, at the head of a mere plantation guard or a day school in uniform. I therefore obtained from the War Department, through Governor Andrew, permission to go and report to General Saxton without at once resigning my captaincy. Fortunately, it took but a few days in South Carolina to make it clear that all was right, and the return steamer took back a resignation of the Massachusetts Commission. Thenceforth my lot was cast altogether with the black troops, except when regiments or detachments of white soldiers were also under my command, during the two years following. These details would not be worth mentioning, except as they show this fact, that I did not seek the command of the colored troops, but it sought me, and this fact, again, is only important to my story for this reason, that under these circumstances I naturally viewed the new recruits rather as subjects for discipline than for philanthropy. I had been expecting a war for six years, ever since the Kansas Troubles, and my mind had dwelt on military matters more or less during all that time. The best Massachusetts regiments already exhibited a high standard of drill and discipline, and unless these men could be brought tolerably near that standard, the fact of their extreme blackness would afford me, even as a philanthropist, no satisfaction. Fortunately, I felt perfect confidence that they could be so trained, 
having happily known by experience the qualities of their race, and knowing also that they had home and household and freedom to fight for, besides that abstraction of the Union. Trouble might perhaps be expected from white officials, though this turned out far less than might have been feared. But there was no trouble to come from the men, I thought, and none ever came. On the other hand, it was a vast experiment of indirect philanthropy, and one on which the result of the war and the destiny of the Negro race might rest, and this was enough to tax all one's powers. I had been an abolitionist too long, and had known and loved John Brown too well, not to feel a thrill of joy at last on finding myself in the position where he only wished to be. In view of all this, it was clear that good discipline must come first. After that, of course, the men must be helped and elevated in all ways as much as possible. Of discipline there was a great need, that is, of order and regular instruction. Some of the men had already been under fire, but they were very ignorant of drill and camp duty. The officers being appointed from a dozen different states, and more than as many regiments, infantry, cavalry, artillery, and engineers, had all that diversity of methods which so confused our army in those early days. The first need, therefore, was of an unbroken interval of training. During this period, which fortunately lasted nearly two months, I rarely left the camp, and got occasional leisure moments for a fragmentary journal to send home, recording many odd and novel aspects of the new experience. Camp life was a wonderful, strange sensation to almost all volunteer officers, and mine lay among eight hundred men suddenly transformed from slaves into soldiers, and representing a race affectionate, enthusiastic, grotesque, and dramatic beyond all others. Being such, they naturally gave material for description. There is nothing like a diary for freshness. At least, so I think, and I shall keep to the diary through the days of the camp life, and throw the later experience into another form. Indeed, that matter takes care of itself. Diaries and letter-writing stop when the field service begins. I am under pretty heavy bonds to tell the truth, and only the truth. For those who look back to the newspaper correspondence of that period will see that this particular regiment lived for months in the glare of publicity, such as tests any regiment severely, and certainly prevents all subsequent romancing in its historian. As the scene of the only effort on the Atlantic coast to arm the Negro, our camp attracted a continuous stream of visitors, military and civil. A battalion of black soldiers, a spectacle since so common, seemed then the most daring of all innovations, and the whole demeanour of this particular regiment was watched with microscopic scrutiny by friends and foes. I felt something as if we were a plant trying to take root, but constantly pulled up to see if we were growing. The slightest camp incident somehow made it back to us, magnified and distorted in the letters of anxious inquiry from remote parts of the Union. It was no pleasant thing to live under such constant surveillance, but it guaranteed the honesty of any success, while fearfully multiplying the penalties had there been a failure. A single mutiny, such as has happened in the infancy of a hundred regiments, a single miniature bull run, a stampede of desertions, and it would have all been over with us. The party of distrust would have got the upper hand, and there might not have been, during the whole contest, another effort to arm the negro. I may now proceed without further preparation to the diary. End of chapter 1 Recording by FNH Remember to visit www.bookranger.co.uk